Good afternoon. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Tom Pritzker, who is uh, an old friend and a good friend, and in spite of that, a nice guy, <laughs> and uh, become very involved in the Aspen Institute, and we're delighted to have him here. He's actually, and his wife Margo are building a home here, and uh, so he has, as you well know, the Pritzker family for 31 years has had uh, something called the Pritzker Architectural Prize, which I would describe in my terms as sort of the Nobel Prize for architecture. And what is so interesting that after all of these years, there actually is no competition that has come up to even come close to challenging the credibility and the honor that goes along with that prize. And I've had the privilege, not being an architect, of uh, attending many of these ceremonies uh, once a year in the country and out of the country. So, Tom, it's quite a privilege, and thank you for doing this. Good. So, thank you very much. Um, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce Frank. We're going to have a conversation for a while. There are microphones over here. Uh, towards the end, we'll leave time for question and answer. And um, please make your questions very difficult so Frank has a hard time. That's part of our job. Um, we'll start with full disclosure, and that is Frank is a very close friend of Margot's and mine. Of Margot's. Of Margot's. <laughs> um, this is an Aspen group, so they completely understand that. I'm a spouse here. Uh, we've traveled together. We've gone to India. We've gone to Papua New Guinea. We've gone to some really funny places together. Um, a short resume, perhaps. I have a question. Could anyone who doesn't know who Frank is please raise their hand? <laughs> um, so Frank's resume reads as follows. Uh, Frank has been the subject of a Simpsons episode. Um, Frank has been the subject of a Sidney Pollack movie. Frank has been the subject of the Apple ad. You remember Think Different? Frank was that. And Frank has had his photo on the cover of more than 50 magazines, um, none of which were Playboy. <laughs> and in the meantime, that's his main, main business. In the meantime, he has received virtually every architectural award uh, in the world. He's received, he received the Pritzker Prize in 89. He's received the AIA Prize, something called the Premium Imperial, uh, and, and is basically accepted as one of the great architects uh, of the world. He basically changed our world with Disney and Bilbao, the Guggenheim and Bilbao, and changed forever how, uh, how architecture is experienced uh, by people. Uh, Frank has designed scores of buildings. He lives an extremely active life. Uh, Frank was in Europe yesterday. Frank was in Africa the day before. Frank was in California yesterday as well. He's going back to California tomorrow. He's going to South America next week. And literally, this is, this is the life he leads. Um, he's designed jewelry, he's designed furniture, he's designed a vodka bottle um, and has been recognized when he walks down the street, he's recognized, widely recognized. Uh, but for those of us who know Frank, he is really one of the warmest, kindest, most human people that any of us, I know there are a lot of you who know Frank and who would echo uh, my comments. Um, Frank received the Pritzker Prize in 89 before Bill Bow and Disney, and in some senses before he was a household word. Uh, that was 20 years ago in the jury citation. Uh, the jury citation referred to him as a restless spirit. I assure you that Frank is still very much a restless spirit, so let me start by welcoming my friend Frank Gehry. Um, let me start by... Are you really doing this to, to audition for the Charlie Rose Show? 
Um, I don't know if Charlie's here, but actually he's in Aspen. I saw him uh, last night, and he's actually formed how we're going to go about this. Um, so you recently had an 80th birthday party. It was the most eclectic group of people I've ever seen assembled. They came from far and wide, and it was really very much a fascinating group. Uh, Frank has three adult children. Frank has a trophy wife. How long have you been married to your trophy wife? <laughs> 33 um, uh, years. 33 years. And he sails, and he's on his BlackBerry 24-7. Uh, Frank um, adores being adored by pretty women and thinks he can get away with it because he's 80 years old. Uh, and has done work all over the world. So what I want to start with is I want to get into, do a little bit of your early career, but really try and understand how your style and how you're thinking about architecture evolved. Uh, born in Toronto, moved, parents moved to California at a young age. So when did you first figure out that architecture was something you wanted to do? I think I must have been 19 or 20. I was a truck driver in the valley, San Fernando Valley. And I was going to night school and I took a class in ceramics at SC on uh, extension. And the teacher was uh, Glenn Lukens, who was a great ceramist. And uh, my first pots are hidden so nobody can ever find them because they are really funny. <laughs> They'll be released after I pass away. Uh, Glenn knew that I wasn't going to become a potter. He knew before I did. Um, <laughs> he was building a house by Rafael Soriano, California architect from the Isle of Rhodes, actually, who was very Miesian, very strict, uh, rigorous steel, uh, hated Frank Lloyd Wright, used to knock every Frank Lloyd Wright and the, and the Hollyhock House with those flowers. Uh, and he would play Bach all day long in his, in his office. Uh, I, he was doing a house for Glenn. Glenn took me to the house under construction. I see this little short guy with a black beret, black shirt, black pants. I'm not trying to copy him, but um, <laughs> with an accent and very animated. And he's telling the steel guys how to put stuff. And it looked, you know, very, very exciting, very exciting. And uh, I must have responded to it. And the next day, Glenn suggested I take an architecture class. And since I was very poor at the time, and SC was very expensive, I think he paid for that class. He must have paid the tuition. And it was a night class, and it, I did well right away. Did, designed little buildings and stuff, and they skipped me in the second year. So it was just like well, happened. Well means the creative side, or well means the, the basics of being an architect? You know, the, the first stuff looks like other people's work. I mean, the very first building looked like a Rafael Soriano building, obviously. But um, I guess they could tell I, mm -hmm. I was doing it somehow. So then that's before the Army. Yes. You then went and defended I then, our country. Uh, was put into second year, and halfway through second year, the teacher called me in and said, I don't think this is for you. <laughs> and that guy, for the last years after that, was working. He was the airport uh, architect, LAX. <laughs> <laughs> and I would run into him every once in a while, and he'd say, OK, OK, OK. <laughs> <laughs> You know, Michael Jordan didn't make his high school basketball team. So really? Yes, that's exactly right. So then you go to work for a guy named Victor Gruen. 
Yeah. Talk a little bit about that and what... Well, what I it, was a rabid uh, socialist. I mean, I belonged to all of the, the, the red. You by the way. I am? Yeah, you still are. Really? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. You know, and I just <laughs> met... I'm trying to negotiate a contract with GSA for the Eisenhower Memorial. I ain't go I'm going to become a Republican. Oh, good. <laughs> We can retire now. We've finished and concluded our conversation. I mean, the first thing they asked me for is my, um, uh, what do you call it, uh, a statement, uh, economic, my financial statement. Financial condition. Statement. Yeah. You know? I said, what's your business? I'm just going to do it. <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> so uh, Victor Gruen was doing social housing, and he was doing... Um, he was thinking about the city and was doing the first shopping centers, but the philosophy behind it was to build these um, new communities, new suburban town centers. And uh, as he designed the shopping centers, he built the town centers and, and the all pedestrian. It was very idealistic. And I went to work for them uh, right out of college, and then I got drafted. So I went to the Army two years in, uh, it was just at the end of the Korean War. I got put in special services and designed day rooms. And my master sergeant in special services was Leonard Nimoy. Really? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's a whole funny story. We could go on. <laughs> um, uh, when I got out, I went to Harvard and studied city planning because I didn't want to design rich guys' houses, I thought. <laughs> uh, <laughs> it turns out I wasn't very good at it when I did them. But um, so I went to Harvard, studied city planning, uh, came back, went to work for Gruen. And I must have stayed there till 60, about four or five years. And the experience there was incredible. I, I was doing <laughs> huge shopping, not very good. I mean, they weren't, I wouldn't call it architecture, but it was commercial buildings. They were trying to do architecture, but um, we did high-rise uh, apartments, and I got to run teams. And that expertise and, uh, and that um, experience, let's say, uh, came back when I opened my own office. I felt very confident I knew at least how to start it, how to do the the basics. Was there something, you did your house in 70, late 70s? 78. 78. Was there, was there a building or an experience that sort of was, was a threshold experience for you that, that started you down the road of, of who you are today? Uh, well, I've told this story many times. The, the uh, Victor Gruen's partner, Victor was Viennese and his partner, design partner, was a fastidious Viennese designer who, you know, perfection and detailing and stuff. So I came out of Gruen with that mindset. And the first projects I got, nobody had a budget to do that. And it was frustrating because you do really nice details and you get hammer marks and uh, crappy plaster jobs and all that stuff. So. I was always interested in art, and, and I was watching Jasper Johns and Rauschenberg and the Combines and, and uh, California tract houses look better under construction. There are miles of wood stud frame that, that look beautiful. Uh, in school, the years I was at, in college, the, the professors had just come back from Japan, so there was a strong influence teaching uh, Japanese 
classical architecture because the wood aesthetic could, could be used in California. And uh, so I, I was fascinated with the raw buildings, uh, fascinated with Rauschenberg, fascinated with uh, the guys, uh, Judd, Andre, and people that were making art that was high art and was uh, made with junk. And I thought, rather than fight this bad workmanship, why don't I join it? Why don't I make it a, a positive? So that was the beginning. And I started using raw plywood and exposed studs and uh, corrugated metal. And uh, there were very small market of people that were interested in that. <laughs> And I used to, when I got interviewed, I finally resorted to calling it something. I called it cheapskate architecture. I figured it was a nice marketing idea that <laughs> people that didn't have a lot of money would come to me. Uh, and that went on for, for quite a while. And, uh, but during that period, I did several houses. Um, um, A couple of them are really special for me. Uh, and then I did my own house, which was an old house, old, uh, what do you call this? I'm getting old, I forget words. Just something I'm going to say, you forget. Uh, a gambled roof, Dutch cologne, Dutch cottage, let's say. And uh, there was space on the side yard to expand, and there was space in front to expand, to space in back. Not very much. On the side, I could get 12 feet, 14 feet. In the front, I could do uh, six feet. In the rear, I could do six or eight feet. And so I decided to wrap the old house with the new house and to play the compositionally against the old house so that people coming down the street would still recognize the old house in there. It was because it was the only two-story building on the street of a single family. And it had an iconic presence in it of its own and I wanted to use that. And uh, you know, it turned out I didn't have much money to spend on it. Uh, I paved the um, 12 feet on the side with asphalt and made it a kitchen and had two floor drains and hosed it down. And, uh, and then big windows and stuff. But um, I still live there. <laughs> so fast forward, Bill... Uh, Disney was designed before Bilbao, but Bilbao was actually open prior to Disney. Disney had a, a whole long story to it. For most of us, Disney and Bilbao were sort of a great breakthrough. That, that is how, what we associate with you. Were they, was that an evolution? Was that an accumulation of experiences? Or was that really a breakthrough for you in terms of design? I can't remember. I I think it it was an evolution, but um, Disney Hall all of a sudden became it couldn't be plywood and corrugated, right? Uh, I mean, it would have been extraordinary if we could have done it that way. <laughs> would have saved a lot of money. Uh, the uh, when I, my name was put in the hopper as one of the contestants, the Disney lawyer, Disney family lawyer, called me in and gave me a list of 50 things that I would not be able to do, and therefore I shouldn't continue this charade of doing the Disney Hall competition because uh, he would never let the Disney family put their name on a building I designed. That's what he told me. 
uh, anyway, when it was done, one of the things on the 50 list was I wouldn't use brass handrails. And so I used glass handrails. <laughs> 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 And I brought him in and I said, okay, enough brass handrails. <laughs> I enjoy that kind of stuff. <laughs> so I told you restless spirit. This is an understatement. So how do you think about these things? Where does, where does something like Disney or well, Bilbao come Well, Disney Hall come comes from? out of, um, first of all, I, Ernest Fleischman was director of the thing and I, for many years, and I met him when he first arrived in L.A. And... Uh, uh, I did some work for him at the Hollywood Bowl. And I continued to work with him at the Hollywood Bowl for many years, during which uh, he tutored me in classical music. He was my mentor. He, he really got me into it. And, um, and I met the musicians, and I knew a lot about how they felt about concert halls. I knew from conductors how they felt. I knew that they could walk into a room and read, read it orally and conduct to it. So there was, there's a lot of, of um, wiggle room, a lot more than you realize in the design. As long as you, you know, there's certain elements of reverberation, reverberation time and all that that have to be done and, and the materials you use and we had a great acoustician working with us but the psychological issues are pretty important so the first thing is that the orchestra has to hear each other which in the channel channeler they never did they can't grow as an orchestra unless they hear each other that was obvious mm -hmm. Uh, so that was primo thing to do. They also had to feel good on stage, so they liked being in the room. So the room was nice to them. So they felt comfortable. So that was another priority. The other issue is the relationship with the audience, so that, uh, you know, I can feel the audience. You can, we can you get a sense of what you guys are up to, even if you don't say anything. Um, that, and the musicians feel that audi audience and that rapport. So they hear better, they play better, they like the room. The audience likes what they hear better. The audience responds better. The orchestra feels better, they play better. <laughs> it's <And> simple. So <laughs> Do you have an idea of, I mean, I... Well, you have I to make a Disney, nice room. I think of Disney Hall this in, from the exterior, basically. Is Forget the I exterior. Began. It starts with that inside. That inside was the key issue. Uh, working with Yasu, I mean, he would say to me, make shapes like... He's Japanese. He would say, gary son, make shapes like that. And... I had this fancy computer so I could make shapes that were spherical. And he went crazy. He said, you can? And so we did. Well, the spherical means the sound is dispersed in many more directions. So there's, rather than just two. Um, the, you need two inches of plaster. That's all. So the ceiling can be white, can be whatever. Two inches of plaster. Psychologically, people feel better in a, in a music hall when there's wood because they feel like it relates to the, the cello, the violin, you know, the, the instruments. And so there's a psychological positive hit you get. In the case of Disney Hall, it costs five million bucks extra to do the wood, which is purely decoration for this psychological effect. And it was weighed, you know. Uh, I think the success of the hall would have been okay with, with the plaster. I'm doing one in plaster now for Michael Tilson Thomas in Miami, which is smaller. Uh, but we, we 
with Ernest and the, everybody, the orchestral committee and the people who were working on it, we decided that wood, the psychological effect was important. Uh, I wanted skylights to bring natural light in because going to the Chandler or other places on a Sunday afternoon concert was like going to a movie, you know, in a matinee. You come out and the, and in, the light in L.A. is so beautiful. Uh, I thought le letting it in would create a positive effect. And so uh, we were able to do some of that, not as much as we wanted. But it's been very positive. So, with your so those are the ingredients. Now, you just, that's a box. And on either side of the box, there's toilets and stairs. <laughs> yeah. And you've got to join those toilets and stairs on each side with a foyer. That's the plan. <laughs> okay. Um, now, you cover it with a material. So, I wanted to cover it in stone because... Uh, you go to concert halls at night, and stone at night picks up the ambient light uh, without having to be lit, and it feels soft and warm and blah, blah, blah. And we designed it that way. Uh, it was The construction was delayed, reasons I don't want to go into. Uh, the uh, Bilbao was built and Bill bows in titanium. And so everybody liked that and wanted me to make Disney Hall in metal. And I, no, you shouldn't do that. Because it's hard to light metal. It looks like a cheap refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I resisted it for a while. And the thing that, made it okay for me to, to I mean, it was a fi another $5 million deal. The stone would have been $5 million more. And they were tight for money. So that was a very important issue. But aesthetically for me, I, the, I hadn't been working on it for a couple of years. And there were things I wanted that were annoying me about some of the shapes. And if it went to metal, I could change those. <laughs> so I did it. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I have a very close friend who's in the audience who's a developer, and uh -oh. I know there are a series of questions that he would like to ask you, so I'm going to ask on his behalf. Okay. Um, can you design a building to a budget, and can you meet that budget? <laughs> See, they don't think I can. <laughs> We're not going to take a We'll take a vote before and after you answer the question. <laughs> Well, I pride myself on meeting budgets, and some of the toughest developers in the world that I work with will uh, attest to that. Uh, architects can't uh, control the markets, the commodities, the labor force, and all of that. So you're not really as in charge of budgets as you think you are, as clients might think you are. Uh, and the construction people aren't in control either. Po it's political. It's the recession now. Prices have come down. If there's inflation, who knows? Arch no architect can, can be re held responsible for that kind of stuff. What we do is uh, manage the process so that there's not a lot of fat in the design so that if the shit hits the fan, <laughs> there's not much you can take out. So you, if you want that kind of building and it comes in too high, you, you either decide not to build it or bite the bullet. But there isn't much you can to do to change it. Uh, and and I, I try my damnedest to stay in that, that realm, that there is no... I call it working close to the bone so that there isn't a lot of stuff. So 
it's counterintuitive because your your designs have lots of curves and and are sculpture. That's what they read. If you look at some of the other great architects, if I use Renzo, his is lines, his is rectilinear. Is yours? Is it more challenging to bring yours in onto a budget than someone who uses what I'll call more conventional drawing, more conventional lines? Well, um, when people, if you look at Bill Bow, the general consensus, when people, I talk to them, they assume it was a very expensive building compared to a rectilinear building at, uh, of the same program. In 97, the building was built for $300 a square foot. Pretty cheap. Uh, at the same time, I, or shortly after, I think, I did a building in Berlin that was all rectilinear at freezer plots, which you've seen. And it's elegantly detailed and it cost $600 a square foot. So I think what happens is that that I don't fuss the details. I sort of go with the flow on what the construction is. I mean, I do bring my cheapskate architecture experience into into play there. I don't. Uh, I let the forms be the thing, and and uh, and the reason to do it, the reason to do those kind of forms, is in my mind was to replace decoration to get passion and feeling into the building without resorting to 19th century uh, models. And I thought about movement because certainly we live in an age of movement. And my precedents for movement go back to Phidias in at the Parthenon, who was able to convey a sense of movement with the uh, shields of the warriors pushing into the stone. When you see the, uh, at the British Museum, you feel the pressure, and it, it, it's, it's an amazing thing that he was able to do. And then the, the Shiva, the dancing figures, which you know, um, you, you look at them and you look back and you're sure they moved, right? And so that was my inspiration, and I thought, can we do it in our, at, at this big scale? And, and that's what the exploration was. And, and there are some fish stories that go along with it in my... <laughs> that um, when the postmodern stuff happened, when, the, when my colleagues started going back to Greek, uh, Greek temples, I thought to... I got pissed off and I said, if you're going to go back, why don't you go back uh, 300 million years before man to fish? And I started drawing fish and, and then it started to have a life of its own and, and uh, it became fish lamps and other things that were byproducts. But I started looking at the fish drawings by Hiroshiga and I started looking look watching the carp and, and the koi fish in the ponds and they're very architectural and I started to explore those shapes and I made a, a terrible one for a 35 foot long wooden fish for a fashion company at the Pitti Palace in in Florence and it was very very kitsch I mean really super kitsch and but it had that sense of movement. I looked at it, I, and everybody got it. And, and then I tried to cut off the tail, cut off the head, cut off the fins, start to abstract it and see how far I could go before I lost it. And I did a room for uh, the Walker Art Museum for a show. And then I did a thing for Jay Chiat. And from that, I learned to... Uh, build with those kind of forms and capture that kind of feeling. And so that was the, the evolution. So you use this CATIA system. So, CATIA. CATIA. The, the reason I raise this, the economic issue, has been asked a lot, 
but the truth is I've watched Frank work and I've, and more importantly, have listened to the way he thinks. And of the various architects that we knew, know, he is the most um, economically oriented, the most budget oriented, and, and sort of views that as, as a major part of the challenge and the exercise. Talk about the, the computer system you use and what role that's played in freeing you up to both do designs and to address the budget issues. Well, the reason I got into it is um, I was doing a building in Switzerland and I couldn't, with normal descriptive geometry that I'd learned in school, could not uh, uh, articulate this curve so that the contractor could build it. And that led us to the aircraft industry and Dassault and their software, which we started using some 30 years ago. Um, the, the culture of architecture is uh, architects hired, client likes architect, architect, client love each other, do a building, they love the building. It goes out to bid, it's too expensive, always. <laughs> Client can't afford expensive building. They need the damn thing. They get the contractor in. Architect is marginalized, infantilized. And that's the normal thing. And, and I mean, I've managed to do stuff in that system and, and try to uh, get on top of it. But the architects, uh, the culture of architecture, the AIA, creates a, a um, overprotective uh, world for the architect with its documents, with its, with its processes. And so I've always believed that the only way to become the master builder, like the old days, where you really carry the, the, your role parentally through to the end of the project, the only way to get there is to take more responsibility. Now, that involves insurance companies and lawyers and all kinds of stuff, and a really changing the culture of how this, these things are done. Um, and so, when I started with the computer, I realized that having in my control more, more information than anybody in the game, I could remain in charge because the contractor loved it. When you gave him, uh, I remember showing the contractor in LA the model of Disney Hall and he said, oh, you can't build that. Uh, when I showed him the mock-up, full scale of the stone wall already built that I made, he was able to understand it and price it in real time without a premium because uh, Bilbao, the steel bids came in 1% spread on six contractors. That means the documents are really clear and it was 18% under budget. Now, when you get a, a subcontractor 18% under budget and there's a spread of, you know, one guy's high, one guy, uh, you, you, take, you won't take the low bidder because it's too scary, right? In this case, 1% spread, you could take any one of them. It was 18%. So it, it's that kind of experience that I've had that, eggs me on to, to de continue to develop the relationship to this system. And the ideal, what I'm shooting for, is uh, a paperless process that's, that, and I think it's inevitable. Dassault did the 777 airplane paperless. If they can do that, I mean, we can build a building paperless. And what that means is that uh, the Construction guys in the field have a laptop instead of 600 pages of drawings where they have to go find the detail. 
it means that the building department can be co co connected online and the approval process can be shorter. This is a, a hard one because of the bureaucracies uh, of the cities. Uh, uh, Bloomberg was willing to try it. LA is willing to try it, but uh, we haven't had a, an opportunity yet to do it, to really do it. Um, but we're going to continue. Then as a byproduct, we found that um, some of the, the uh, organization of, of the construction on the site can be uh, uh, worked out in 3D modeling ahead to eliminate crises like the scaffolding doesn't quite fit or the materials get there early, uh, or in the case of Ground Zero, uh, I have a separate company now doing all this because it, it got pretty exciting. Uh, at Ground Zero, they've, they, when, when, they were, when Silverstein was going to build all those buildings at once, they analyzed the traffic patterns so that uh, the delivery of materials and delivery of personnel could be managed, um, and it was worked all worked out in advance so that you wouldn't put the place into gridlock. Uh, all of these things lead to savings, and and uh, it's you can in, in Hong Kong using this not a building I did, uh, but for Swire, they registered 15% savings in the construction of an 80-story building. So that's what I mean by becoming the master builder and taking over the process. And I use the computer as I design. So I make these models and I, I uh, digitize the shapes very quickly into the computer. You can tell I don't understand all of this, but <laughs> I don't know how to turn the thing on even, but <laughs> but we analyze the uh, floor area, the exterior building surface, and the interior volume. And so that I can tell as I'm doing the modeling if I'm getting out of scale, because sometimes you, you can fall in love with shapes and things and you, you go down a track and you can't backtrack because you're caught in this aesthetic thing. And, and then you're retrofitting. So it's better to, to know where you're going. And this is a method I use to figure it out so I don't get in trouble down the line. So when we were in India, you were working on a project in Princeton. And I watched you doodling. And you've got these doodles that you seem to use as you're working on a building. What's going on? <laughs> I'm just doodling. <laughs> um, that's how I think things out. So when I start, I take a program, say uh, the, the Disney Hall. I knew the size of the box. I knew the side boxes. I knew the relation to the street. I mean. This is all information that was in my head. And architecture is like it is in the end. It is uh, hand-to-eye coordination. And how do you get these ideas out so they can become manifested into a, a real building? So I start sketching. But if you look at the sketches carefully, you'll see that the proportion of the elements are very close to the base models. So I, I'm, and I'm thinking interior. It's not, I'm not designing from the outside in. I'm designing from a very complete knowledge of the program, how I want the things to fit together, how they must fit together. And, and so the sketches are very um, uh, filled with information, more than a layman. You wouldn't see it at all. Yeah. Uh, the 
guys in the office, the kids in the office, know how to read a lot of this with me now. And they, they go, can interpret it into the models. Uh, when the buildings are finished, then you look at the, <laughs> it's uncanny, you look at the very first sketch and there's, it's almost there. And I've always wondered why it takes so long if it, <laughs> why I can't go. Um, we're going to do Q&A in a couple of minutes. I got a couple of questions sort of now. Now you've had a long career. Yeah. And is there a building you haven't done that you'd like to do? A Hyatt Hotel. <laughs> Do I win the prize? So last night, so you understand, we were at dinner, and w not with Frank. And we were talking about what questions were we going to ask. And I said, well, you know, the one I want to ask is, is there a building that you haven't done? But I'm afraid to ask it because the answer is going to be I want to do a Hyatt Hotel. <laughs> um, okay, so knows me so well. we'll move on from no, there. No, but I, I, <laughs> I really don't. Yearn after. I mean, there are things I'd like to do, but I don't. I'm very superstitious about that, so I don't yearn after things because I know I'll get all hung up, you know, yearning after it, and I don't. I don't want to go there. I don't want to waste the time. So I take stuff as it comes more, and it's a better place to be because people uh, come to you. They want you. You're, you're in a better relationship to do better work, I think, and create a partnership. How do you think about the client? What is the client's role? Is the perfect client, I was with Philip Johnson one day in his office and he got a call and it was a lady on the other line and she was obviously going to hire him to do a building and basically what she said is you have an unlimited uh, budget and you have complete freedom to build anything you want. He hung up and he said, now there's the perfect client. <laughs> no. I w uh, that's the worst client, I think. I think, uh, you know, it's like the sound of one hand clap. If I were to just keep doing it, I'd repeat myself. But what makes the fun is to engage a client, get engage in uh, a process. It's a, a t I see it partly I'm a teacher to them, and partly they're a teacher to me. And uh, if you're open to that, it, it evolves so that the building then feels like something they want. They're part of it. They're in it. And uh, they understand the choice. They've had an opportunity to make choices along the way uh, as my ideas are put on the table. They can steer it. Um, the only scary thing to a client, I think, from me, is that I don't have a preconceived thing. So I'm, I like to work intuitively. So I'm responding to them, space, time, and everything, intuitively. And that must be, seem mysterious and a little bit scary from the other side. Um, it, they don't know exactly how this is going to come out. If they could get over that fear and play, they're going to come out better because they're going to be more in control than they, than they realized and more part of it. And it leads to a better and a newer idea, newer ideas and better building, I think. Let's take some questions over here. As, as far as I know, I don't think you've done anything in Washington, D.C., in the district, except now you have the Eisenhower Memorial. You're going to have... Well, I did the Corcoran, but they didn't build it. That's right. <laughs> that was... But uh, I, I got Fine Arts Commission approval, so... Okay. Uh, at, at the Eisenhower Memorial, you got... It's across the street from the Smithsonian in a park. You're going to have uh, budget restrictions, space restrictions, political restrictions. What do you got in mind for, uh, for the Eisenhower Memorial? <laughs> well, I'm not allowed to tell you. <laughs> uh, we did a proposal, which uh, is why we were selected. But um, it was 
publicly represented as not a design, but as a, uh, for them to see how I think about stuff. And, uh, but, but it doesn't look like Bill Bow, so you don't have to worry. <laughs> uh, and it's in, it's interesting. It's some new technology, and it. I th I think what happened is uh, when I got into it, I found out things about. You know, of course, you don't know about this great man and what he was like, and all. And I read all the stuff, and and. Uh, uh, really got into it. And I think even I'm getting into it even more, uh, meeting uh, with um, the people who were around him at the time. It's a very, very dense and, and uh, wonderful life he had, and uh, the accomplishments are amazing, and how he did it, and his strengths. And so how do you represent that how do you represent him? And for me, the only great memorial in, for presidents is Lincoln, right? Jefferson. But then the new ones haven't been so great, I don't think. And uh, the idea of casting a bronze statue of Ike in his Ike jacket doesn't appeal to me. I thought it was cold and inhuman, not, not him. Uh, so try to figure out a way and and the site has traffic in it it's independence avenue it's, you know it's not it's not on the mall it has surrounded by three or four buildings and they're not great architecture so uh so it's complicated and what i tried to do was figure out a way that uh it could be big and powerful but modest, so that most of the time it was very low key, and then on if it birthday or B D Day or whatever you want to celebrate, it could become as big as the Lincoln Memorial for that that event, without changing it and doing it with lighting and stuff and without tricky stuff. I mean, it had to be substantial, and we're doing studies. Uh, the Getty is helping me, uh, trying to analyze some of the ideas we have, um, how to, how to uh, vet the aging process for the materials and things. So they're, we're, and they have a way of, of doing that. So we're going to uh, uh, age the material 200 years, on that, for that specific location and see what happens to it. And for the sculpture, uh, the three-dimensional, I want to use reliefs like, like uh, the Greek reliefs in stone because stone, I think, is warmer. And, and, um, and I found some young Chinese uh, sculptors that work with Sai Kuo Chan who in front of your eyes, I saw them take a, if you saw the show at the Guggenheim, uh, in front of your eyes, they took a picture of a Chinese peasant and they made a 3D perfect rendition, right? In, I mean, they're so facile. And so my fantasy is to get these kids to model in clay these elements, these uh, vignettes of Eisenhower, uh, not life. It has to be larger than life size to to work. And then somehow translate that into stone with computer and stuff. So it's it's uh, very interesting. But mainly is how do you transmit? How do you capture this man's uh, life in sort of this kind of trivial? Trivia, how do you make it important? in a traffic place with the stuff that that's that's so that's what we're trying to do. over here great uh, my name is Fred Kent I uh, run a group called project for public spaces uh, we're known as the Department of Corrections we have to go into cities to retrofit public 
buildings, public spaces all over the world. I think I travel as much as you do. Uh, but there, and there, what we're finding is that there's something that's changing in the, and needs to change in the world of architecture, which is the iconic building needs to become a place. A what? A, a place and create a sense of place. A lot of the iconic buildings aren't getting much visitation, so they're not, uh, they're not holding their own in terms of the economics. There's very little to do around them. People come and look at them. They admire them. They may like them. I like a lot of your buildings. Uh, but people have more reasons to go to a city to a, than just to look at a building. They have to do many, many things. I was just in Norway last week, and uh, the new opera house is a building where people can become engaged in many, many ways in that building, from an economic point of view, from just walking up and down. It's just a, an amazing building. It's not part of the larger city yet, and it will become that. So my question is, how do we take the marvelous, iconic architecture that we've had, give more reasons for people to be there, become an iconic place as well as a piece of iconic architecture. How do you put those two together? So because which I, one of my so well, I think that you don't could, do it. Well, and I think you <laughs> Tell see. Tell me I, which one. I don't think you're there yet. You see, and I ah. at that what I'm trying to do is challenge you because I think you can do both. The the, the figures don't support your position. Oh, I think they do. I think they do. But I, but I'm trying to challenge you to be able to do that because it's much more exciting than just a piece of architecture to also have this no, iconic your, place. No, but your your question is very insulting to me. I'm sorry, but I have to go and fix the places up around. Not the world. my place. He ain't fixed. I would have to say I would. <laughs> no. Anyway, no, you asked it. You asked. It's a asked very pompous. You're you're pers you're a very pompous guy here. No. Please, please. I have to. <laughs> you asked. You asked. Thank you're, you. You're in a self-promotion. Stop it. We got to keep going. Yeah. Let's do one more over there. We're going to do one more, and then we're going to wrap it up. So you started your early career working with Gruen, and uh, he was known for uh, social work, and, uh, uh, social housing, and many people don't uh, uh, know the work you've done with Maggie Center, and I don't know if it's yet to be announced that your firm's about to work in New Orleans on the Make It Right. Um, there's a lot of kind of social responsibility, kind of a thin thread that, that's gone through your career. Uh, recently, you and I were asked to speak about the future of architecture on our radio program, and you mentioned that uh, architects who do modest work are yet to find their voice. And I think the way it was edited came across not the way you meant it, and I would like to hear what you meant by that phrase. What did I say? That, <laughs> that, that architects who do modest work are, have yet to find their voice. Well, I think architecture has to find its own voice. I mean, I think most of what's built is not architecture, right? I mean, there is, uh, I'd say, probably less than 1% of the built environment would qualify as architecture. And then within architecture, there's good architects, and there's mediocre architects, and there's bad architects, and there's all kinds of flavors. So the number of buildings are pretty small uh, that reach some kind of level. But there, there is certainly uh, a place for, uh, in the built environment for uh, the modest, modest construction of certainly in housing uh, the, the planning is, becomes more important, the creation of the public spaces. The, um, the, arc, the buildings become more background. And uh, a lot of them have become, a lot of the buildings that should have been more background have been layered with all kinds of junk and so-called decoration and, and they're, you know, and people seem to want that, and and uh, so that's kind of what I'm talking about. Is that I'm th I'm thinking a lot of young people who are hitting the decks now that um, there's a lot of room for exploration. Iconic, build, the word iconic has been abused a lot because uh, I I really believe in history. <coughs> The buildings that are important to have some kind of uh, iconic statement 
have been courthouses, uh, theaters, music halls, co opera halls, library, uh, and and public buildings, and, and uh, city halls, and so on. Um, and the background buildings uh, should be should be that I think. You know, I don't I don't think everything should should have this exuberance or because when you go around the world people go visit the Parthenon, the cathedrals, the great buildings that that uh, identify cities. Cities become identified with those those places and those buildings and uh, and then from there, it's how the city is planned around those buildings and how the, the city is, is accessible and usable. So a, quick, a very quick follow-up. Follow if it's not exuberant, is it not architecture? No, I'm not saying that. Okay. No, Just... no, 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 not at all. Let's go over yes. here. I was in Chicago last weekend, and I saw the uh, outdoor concert hall that you designed at Millennium Park, and it's, it's beautiful. I was just wondering, and I know it gets used a lot, um, so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about that, about the design of that uh, facility. Well, my friend Cindy Pritzker asked me to do it. <laughs> um, the, the issue there was the park, you weren't allowed to build buildings in the park. You could build an outdoor uh, theater, but all you could do was the band shell. And, uh, and you, but you could build sculpture. And so she thought that I was enough sculptural that I could probably finesse it. So <laughs> we'd get a twofer. <laughs> and uh, so I think that was the reason she uh, tapped me to do it. Um, <clears throat> it grew from the inside out. It was designed as a functioning outdoor facility and it had a need for 15,000 people on the lawn for concerts and the only way to get the sound out that far was a in, in with quality was a distributed sound system and there were two ways to do it columns with a speaker every 40 feet which would create a maze of stuff, or build a trellis to hang it from. Um, and so that trellis came about just to hang those speakers. And they're not very heavy, the speakers, but the trellis is. The trellis then became a define, because it's in the city, it sort of defined the space. So when you're on, on the green in it, you feel like you're in the space of the of the hall, and you're hearing the music as good as it was, it is. So you're, it feels like you're in a yeah. hall, and acoustically and visually, you feel contained. And that was the other thing that, that happened. And then the great thing that happened was that this tre when you're in the space, the trellis frames the Chicago buildings all, all over the place. And, and makes them part of the, the scene. So it was all about doing that kind of thing. Well, thank you. It's beautiful. Everybody should go see it. So, so we're, we're out of time. I apologize. Um, I just want to close with a, with a quick story and statement. Um, so Margot and I were with our three boys in Madrid, and they were teenagers. And we said, we want to take you to see Bill Bilbao. And they said, what's Bilbao? And we explained it was a museum. And we got bitching and moaning, and we got bitching and moaning for an hour and a half that it took to get from the hotel to the plane to, the, to Bilbao. And we get to the Guggenheim, and it was a remarkable transformation. Their eyes lit up. They walked down those stairs, and they started running their hands along the panels and then they were running up and down, up and down the museum, and literally it transformed their, the, the chemistry in their brain. 
And so what I want to do is thank you for all of us, from all of us who've enjoyed your architecture and really learned a lot about what architecture is about from you. Thank you very much. Thank you.